On RPM tonight, Ray Evernham jazzes up a so far ho-hum Winston Cup season by reuniting a former champion with the car number he made famous. As sure as I'm standing here, the man can win races. NASCAR officials have also done their best to help jazz up the season with the new rules change for the Monte Carlos. But is it enough to save the day? And Michael Schumacher might be a bit too hungry in his bid to win a third Formula One World Driving Championship. We're not monkeying around. RPM Tonight is next. You've waited a long time to, to make for us to make this announcement about drivers. But I got to tell you, I've been waiting really bad since Christmas because this guy gave me this really nice leather jacket at Christmas, and it's got his name on it, and I couldn't wear it. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it gets cold today so I can wear this jacket. Hello, everyone. I'm John Kernan. Welcome to RPM Tonight. It may not be cool enough for Ray Abraham to wear his new jacket until Sunday, unless he wanted to use it this afternoon to keep himself dry, because... It rained a little bit on Friday at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. But earlier in the day, Evernham finally revealed to the world who would drive one of his cars next year in the comfort of the Atlanta Motor Speedway's infield media center. Speculation on Evernham's drivers has run rampant ever since he announced last fall that he would lead Dodge's return to the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. Matt Yoakum was at today's news conference and says the name of the driver really wasn't a surprise. He is the cornerstone that I needed to put this program on solid ground. And at this time, I'm not going to make you wait any longer. I'd like to introduce you to the first driver of Everham Motorsports, Mr. Bill Elliott. Ray Everham's signing of Bill Elliott for one of his two cars was the worst kept secret in the garage. The move, which includes purchasing Elliott's team, provides a strong base to build on and allows Elliott a chance to concentrate fully on driving. It took a while to do it. Uh, like I said, I had to fight with a lot of emotions, you know, my dad's involvement over the years and, and knowing what he wanted me to do and, you know, the fan side of the deal and a lot of other stuff. But, you know, it, it not only made more sense for me, but for everybody involved. I believe, as sure as I'm standing here, the man can win races. And uh, I think that when your confidence is down and you're probably a little physically tired from trying to run a business and drive a race car, that uh, maybe you can't give everything that you could have given on Sunday. I can't continue the level I need to be in a single car deal. I don't have the access to technology or anything else. And I've been trying to struggle with, with how I need to make my team better or continue on in this sport. And, and you, you come to a crossroads and there's a lot of different ways to go. And this was absolutely the best opportunity. I'm blown away, Matt. I am blown away. It's just been... It's just one great thing happens after another, and it's just, uh, like I said, I get up in the morning and thank God and pinch myself that uh, it's just one great thing after another starts to happen. The pairing of Evernham and Elliott wasn't a shocker, but no one could have predicted one surprise during the announcement. There's something wrong there, Ray. There's, there's something wrong with the number on this car. What's, what's the matter with it? Here, I'll, let's go up here, I'll show you. Uh, I think it needs to be this number right here. What about that, guys? I think it is the right move for us to let Bill have his day in the sun again. And it meant a lot to Dad to try and get Bill back in the nine towards the last few years. We weren't able to do that. So I think he'll be looking down and excited to uh, to see Bill back in victory lane. I know Mark's struggling with this. You know, we've got a lot of history back with the nine, and a lot of things have happened. And, you know, when, when Ray uh, uh, approached me with this deal, it was like, I can't believe he came to me. And really, really honored to have that man drive our Dodge and even more honored to, to be able to, to bring back his number nine. Elliott fulfills Evernham's goal of hiring a veteran driver, but the signing of a younger, second driver might not be far behind. I carry a contract in my briefcase all the time. I'd like to go out and I want, I'd, I'm going to run out of here on a dead run and see if I can't get it, get it done. Um, but uh, when we do, we want to make sure that we take the proper time, notify the right people, you know, again, it's complicated. While Evernham was officially announcing the first of his two drivers, his team had a new Dodge Intrepid in the Lockheed Wind Tunnel at Marietta, Georgia. The first on-track test is scheduled for April 4th in Homestead. In Hampton, Georgia, I'm Matt Yoakum, ESPN. Thanks, Matt. The Dodge brand has accounted for 162 wins over the years in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. Its last win came in 1977 when Neil Bonnet captured the race in Ontario, California. 
And Dodge has won four NASCAR Winston Cup championships, the last one coming in 1975 with the king, Richard Petty, behind the wheel. In other news, Champ Car driver Dario Franchitti got the green light from Dr. Steve Olvey to return to the driver's seat on Friday. Franchitti, who had been out of action since being injured in a crash at Homestead in February, plans to test next weekend at Nazareth. Rain delayed NASCAR wants to go qualifying a little over an hour on Friday afternoon, but it was well worth the wait for Dale Jarrett. The defending NASCAR Winston Cup champion won the pole position with a lap of 192.574 miles an hour. Not a track record. That's up to around the 197 mile an hour range, but he was happy nonetheless to win the pole on Friday, and he is with Matt Yoakum. Well, all last season, Dale Jarrett didn't win a pole, but this year, two in four races. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you know, our guys have worked extremely hard on the cars, on the engines, and uh, when you have that good combination, uh, it makes my job a lot easier. Even though the job here is never easy, uh, no matter how good a car you have, this is a tough lap uh, to make in qualifying. But uh, we've made all the right changes, got a good draw to go out late, and all of that worked to our advantage. How treacherous of a lap was it? Uh, I mean, you know, it's almost wide open around here, and then when you're running close to 200 miles an hour, that, that's pretty tough. Uh, you're thinking about a mile-and-a-half racetrack and, and running those speeds. Uh, uh, this, to me, is, is the hardest lap that we make. I mean, you feel speed more here than anywhere else that we go. A new tire here. A lot of guys had trouble with it in qualifying. Do you feel like it will be a good tire for your race package? Uh, I'm hoping it will be. I know Goodyear worked awful hard to, to get a tire that was going to be good for everybody here. Uh, you know, we had our problems this morning getting the car adapted uh, to the new tire, but I think it's just something you have to work around. So hopefully it will be something that will benefit everyone, and uh, we can get this great racing that everybody talks about. The racing's been so bad, so uh, I hadn't seen it be so bad, but uh, hopefully it can be exciting for the fans here in Atlanta. Well, Dale Jarrett hasn't been bad at Atlanta in the last seven races. Five times he was second and won victory. John? Check out the front row on the outside. It's Dale Earnhardt Jr., the rookie, 192.333 miles an hour. Car number eight, not number three. But he started third last week at Las Vegas. His teammate Steve Parker did the tire test back in January at Atlanta, grabbed the third starting position. Another rookie, Matt Kenseth, out of Roush Racing, rolls off from the fourth spot at 192.14. His teammate Kevin LePage qualified fifth at 192.080. And once again, Jerry Nadeau leads the Hendrick Motorsports contingent with the sixth fastest lap in qualifying, uh, 192 and some change. But back up to that front row, Dale Earnhardt Jr. with his best Winston Cup start ever. It's typical Atlanta, I guess. Uh, I hope it's fast enough to be in the top five, top ten. I think it's a good lap. and um, that's, We've been pretty fortunate this year with qualifying. A great job by the motor program. We changed motors right before qualifying. and Looking forward to the race, man. I hope we got a good car for the race. We're pretty happy with the way it turned out. It's faster than we, we practice, and we're not known for our qualifying proudness, but uh, hopefully today maybe that will stand up for a good top ten run car's been real, real unstable throughout the whole day, and this was the first run I had it where I could actually uh, actually hang on to it. So it was, uh, I couldn't expect much more than that. If I would have known it was going to stick that good, I could have ran a little quicker, but not much. We were off a little bit in practice, but, you know, Pat Trison and all the guys, we put our heads together to get this familyclick.com a good run, and, uh, you know, we'll see where it, where it ends up. It'll be somewhere in the top 20, top 15, and, you know, we just get ready for Sunday. That was all she had. I mean, uh, I thought it was a pretty good lap. Uh... I just about was about flat. I mean, I was I lifted just a little bit, set the car back on the gas. I mean, the car drove superb. Guys did a good job. Uh, we'll just have to uh, get him next time. I think we got a better race car than a qualifying car. Nadeau's teammate Jeff Gordon, the three-time NASCAR West Cup champion, starts from the seventh position, and it's Joe Nemechek starting eighth. Ninth, Dave Blaney in a Pontiac, and the interesting thing, he went out to take his qualifying lap, didn't have third gear, felt the vibration, came back in, they checked things out, sent him out. He, uh, on the warm-up lap, went from second all the way to fourth, but built up enough momentum to grab the ninth starting position. Bill Elliott continues to run well. He was 10th fastest, Mark Martin 11th, and how about Robert Presley? 12th fastest, but back to the seventh starter, Jeff Gordon. Here's what he had to say about his lap. I've never really qualified well here in and I think that instead of trying to just go to the car, I, I think that you can drive this place so many different ways. And uh, I decided I was going to drive a little bit different qualifying, and, and it stuck really well. It was a good lap, but I got uh, messed up in three and four. The car got too tight and uh, just trying to hold the gas wide open. And, and it was more than I've been in practice, just knowing you have to step it up. And it just got a little bit too tight on me. Top 25 is all we wanted and to go 
you know, race practice in the morning. So we're happy. Well, I'm still shaking. Uh, I'm glad it's over with. We were off a good bit in practice, and we got a little closer for qualifying. Uh, got a good lap. Probably could have got a little bit better lap, but anything in the top 15 will suit me fine after where we started out the practice today. Checking out more of the first round qualifiers for Sunday afternoon's Cracker Barrel 500 at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Chad Little always seems to run well in Atlanta. He qualified 13th at 191.192. Mike Skinner had been second fastest in practice, but he went out late in the round, and maybe the track had slowed down because he did down to the 14th position. Rookie Jeff Fuller, a good, solid qualifying effort, 15th fastest. Brett Bodine, he uh, had some problems last week at Las Vegas. He's solidly in the field this week, as is Stacy Compton, the rookie, and Ward Burton grabbed the 18th starting position with a lap of 190.922 miles an hour. Scott Pruitt started second last week in Las Vegas. This week, he starts from the 20th position. Bobby Labonte, who's been the Atlanta master over the last few years, is going to have a ways to go to get to the front on Sunday afternoon as he rolls off from the 22nd spot. Rick Mast was the last driver to lock in a starting position on Friday. He missed the show last week at Vegas, but Rick qualified 25th this week at 189.733 miles an hour. But how about his good buddy, Robert Presley, who grabbed the 12th starting position? We was real close in practice, and thought we had, you know, I should have run an 80, but I hung it out too far up there in turn one and couldn't get it back to the bottom. Caterpillar called the eye, but it's not as good as it needs to be. It uh, drove it any hard out of wreck to come close to wrecking anyway, but we'll get it Sunday. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't really know what to expect. We, we haven't been fast enough to do much damage today anyway, so uh, well, we'll take it. I mean, we'll see what, where it ends up putting us. It's uh, not looking too good, though. NASCAR done a great job getting the track dried off. A little bit dusty, but... All in all, they've done a great job. The uh, track's in good shape. I think everybody will be surprised when they go out there, but a uh, little bit nerve-wracking going out first car. NASCAR, of course, made a rules change early this week to try and help the Monte Carlos in the front-end downforce area, and NASCAR officials have always said they want a level playing field, and after first-round qualifying, here's how that field looks. Ford placed 12 cars in the top 25. Jarrett won the pole. There are eight Chevys in the top 25, fastest belonging to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Five Pontiacs made it in first-round qualifying. Later on RPM tonight, no level playing field in Formula One. And Michael Schumacher hopes Ferrari's off-season efforts give him the advantage. When we come back, regardless of where he qualifies, Bobby Labonte is the man to beat in Atlanta. RPM tonight is brought to you by Fridays, home of the Jack Daniels Grill. Here's a look at the rest of the starting lineup for Saturday afternoon's Aaron's 312 at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Derek Gilchrist led the way in second round qualifying on Friday with a lap of 183.455 miles an hour. That's 15th fastest overall. Former series champion Randy LaJoy rolls off from the 30th starting position. Last year's winner of this race, Mike Skinner, starts 33rd after qualifying at 182.338 miles an hour. Rookie P.J. Jones grabbed the 35th starting position while Kenny Irwin notched the last available starting spot through qualifying speed. The rest of these drivers all needed provisional spots to make the show, including rookie Mike Borkowski, who starts 37th. Casey Atwood, who's rumored to be Ray Evernham's second West Cup driver for next year, starts 40th. Bobby Hillen got the last provisional starting position. Four of the last times that the NASCAR Winston Cup Series has raced at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, Bobby Labonte has won the race. So he should be strong again this weekend, even though he starts about in the mid-pack. Well, our expert crew is in Atlanta to bring you all the action this week. So let's head out to the racetrack to check in with them. Here's Bill Weber. Well, John, as you well know, qualifying day here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway can be one of the most frightening days, one of the most nerve-wracking days of the NASCAR Winston Cup season. We've seen some very hard crashes during qualifying here in the past. That wasn't the case today. Still, qualifying on this day, one of the most tricky and maybe one of the most treacherous days in the history of this track. Why? Because Goodyear brought their new generation tire to Atlanta for the first time. Very similar to the tire that was run at the second Michigan race and the second Charlotte race in 1999. Two guys had a little bit of experience on it. Tony Stewart and Steve Park. For everybody else, a new experience today. And it really threw some guys for a loop including, I would say, the 88 bunch, because this morning in practice, their car was very, very loose. But they made a major change to the right front suspension of that car. And after Dale Jarrett went out after that change, he said the car was much better. Jarrett certainly earned his pole on the racetrack, but that pole was probably won by his crew in the garage early this morning. Jerry Punch? 
Bill, they say the high speeds here at Atlanta play into the hands of the veteran drivers, but let's hear it for the freshman class of 2000, the Peach Fuzz Gang. How about it? Six rookies qualifying in the top 20, three in the top 10, and two in the top four. Dale Earnhardt Jr. gets his best qualifying effort ever. Second, he qualified third with you at Vegas. And the guy behind me, how about Matt Kenneth? He's fourth here in qualifying. He will be on the pole in Saturday's Bush Series event. A couple of young drivers battling along with the others for the Ray Bessis Rookie of the Year title here in the year 2000. But Bob and Benny, qualifying is one challenge. The big challenge comes on race day. That's exactly right, Jerry. With all due respect to those who qualified well here today, when they drop the green flag on the race Sunday, it's a whole new ball game. That's right, because these cars, I don't think all of them are going to be able to stay on the bottom of the racetrack. A few might, and they might win the race, but most of these cars will have to move up the racetrack, trying to find some green racetrack to find a grip. So we'll see cars on the bottom, and we'll see cars in the middle, and we'll see cars on the very, very top. Atlanta Motor Speedway over the past couple of years has lent itself to very, very competitive racing something we look forward to on Sunday afternoon. Bill? Absolutely, Bob. There have been 81 NASCAR Winston Cup races here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway 48 times. 59% of the time, the winner has started in the top five. There are some huge names that will come from the back of the pack here, but on this track, they'll have a lot of work ahead of them. We'll see what happens when the green flag falls here on Sunday. John, we'll see you here then. Can't wait to get there, Bill. The Cracker Barrel 500 takes the green flag shortly after one Sunday on ABC Sports. Watch all the action. Jeff Gordon trying to get his season back on track. NASCAR's new rules change to help the Monte Carlo should aid his effort. Cracker Barrel 500 live Sunday on ABC Sports. Coming up right after the Cracker Barrel 500 is round one of this year's International Race of Champions. Watch all the exciting action. Twelve of the best drivers in the world compete head-to-head -head on the high banks in Daytona. Exciting IROC action Sunday at 5 Eastern on ABC Sports. When RPM Tonight returns, is NASCAR doing all it can to level the playing field? Some heavy hitters failed to make it in first round qualifying at Atlanta, including last year's Rookie of the Year, Tony Stewart, last week's winner at Vegas, Jeff Burton, and former Atlanta winner, Rusty Wallace. Elliot Sadler was 31st fastest in qualifying on Friday afternoon. Jeremy Mayfield, 33rd. Ricky Rudd, who had started no worse than second the first three races, he's all the way back in the 34th spot. Dale Earnhardt concentrated more on race setup Friday afternoon than qualifying. He was 35th overall. Earlier this week, NASCAR gave the Chevy Monte Carlo a couple inches of front spoiler. The decision came as an attempt to level the playing field between all three makes competing for the Winston Cup. Thanks to wind tunnel testing, NASCAR Chief Operating Officer Mike Helton believes that NASCAR has found the answer. What we found in a wind tunnel is, is it gives the, uh, the nose of the car a little bit more downforce, uh, balances out the car a little bit better, uh, but, but just by very small amounts. But that, we think that that may be in the right direction for the, uh, the Monte Carlo to be able to make the long runs and, and wear tires and and the other components equal to the other makes. Everybody will be paying close attention to happy hour on Saturday to see one of those Chevys make a long run. Johnny Benson, who's off to a great start, qualified 40th fastest on Friday. We'll see if he goes in the second round. Mike Bliss was 43rd overall at a little over 187 miles. Now, Ted Musgrave is still subbing, but Jeffrey Bodine was 45th fastest, 186.805. And Kyle Petty, the slowest lap of the day, 48th, 182.717. Still to come on RPM tonight, this crash last year at Silverstone could lead Michael Schumacher to another title. Qualifying for Sunday's Daytona 200, AMA Superbike race got underway on Friday with Troy Bayless posting the top speed on his Ducati. Bayless checked in at almost 117.5 miles an hour. Doug Chandler, whom we talked to earlier this week, turned the fifth fastest lap to lead the Kawasaki contingent with a lap of 116.463 miles an hour. Two-time world champion Michael Schumacher set the pace as practice for this weekend's season opening. Grand Prix got underway in Australia, but Michael pushed things a little too hard and wound up spinning out and crashing into one of the barriers. Michael had missed several, seven events last year after breaking a leg at Silverstone was uninjured in today's crash and says it was a case of driver error. He just pushed his car a little bit too hard. The defending world champion Mika Hakkinen turned the fourth quickest lap of the day. He also had some trouble spinning out on the last lap, but Mika didn't hit anything. Schumacher's quick lap wound up just 14 thousandths of a second better than Hockenden's teammates. David Coulthard toured the Albert Park circuit in 1 minute 32.144 seconds. Schumacher's new teammate Rubens Barrichello was third overall and former world champion Jacques Villeneuve was pleasantly surprised with his fifth quickest lap while 
Pedro Diniz wound up sixth overall with a lap of 1 minute 33.597 seconds. Practice resumes on Saturday, and it'll be interesting to see if Schumacher will be near the same pace he set on Friday. Prior to the first practice session, Schumacher told reporters that missing out on the chase for the championship last year because of that accident has really motivated him for this year. Naturally, I do feel very hungry because I, I missed out uh, a good opportunity last year. And I feel the opportunity is even greater because we seem to be prepared much better than ever. So uh, obviously all of this together uh, makes, me, makes me very optimistic, very hungry, very motivated. Heinz Errol Frenson pushed his Jordan to the seventh quickest lap on the day at 1 minute, 33.698 seconds. Schumacher's former teammate Eddie Irvine was 10th overall in the Jaguar. And one name missing from this list is rookie Jensen Button. He was 18th quickest in his Williams. RPM Tonight will be right back. RPM Tonight is brought to you by Wendy's 99 cents crispy chicken nuggets. A small price to pay for great chicken. And by Wolverine the world's most comfortable boots and shoes, guaranteed. Reese Davis and company keep you up to date on all the news from the world of motorsports this weekend right here on ESPN2. RPM Tonight comes your way Saturday at 9 Eastern. Sunday at high noon, it's RPM Today to help you get ready for the big race. And then Reese is back Sunday night at 9 with a complete wrap-up of the day's action. Sunday, NASCAR Today takes a close-up look at two of the favorites for the Cracker Barrel 500, Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart. And Ray Evernham explains how Chevy plans to nose out the competition. NASCAR Today, Sunday, 1230 on ESPN2. Looking forward to it, Bill. Ten drivers failed to qualify for Saturday afternoon's Bush Series race at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Among them, veteran Hermie Sadler, former Winston Cup regular Rich Bickle, also missed the show, as did rookies Jason Leffler and Dave Steele. And don't forget, we have all the action of the year in 312 covered for you over on ABC Sports. Matt Kenseth starts from the pole position. He won the season opening race in Daytona, but Mark Martin rolls off in the fourth spot. He won at the Rock and finished second last week at Las Vegas. It's the Aarons 312 Live, Saturday afternoon on ABC Sports. Be sure to check your local listings. Finally, Indy Racing Northern Light Series officials announced Friday that the schedule this year would only include nine races. There had been a slot on the schedule with a TBA beside it, but... Tony George, the IRL founder, says they were unable to put together the right deal. Check out RPM Now on ESPN Radio this weekend. We'll talk to Rusty Wallace, Ray Everham, Barry Green, and others. If your local ESPN Radio affiliate doesn't carry the show, you can listen to it on the Internet by visiting ESPN.com and following the radio link. We will see you back here again Monday night, 7 o'clock Eastern. The professor will be here to recap all of this weekend's action in Atlanta, and he might even talk a little Formula One. You don't want to miss it. Good night, everybody. RPM Tonight is a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, part of the Go Network. Go.com.